Good morning, Catherine. Welcome to Questions with Connie. I'm so glad to meet you. Good morning. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. I'm thrilled. I mean, I've just always known of you and seen you in the paddock and have never met. So I'm not usually easily starstruck, but I'm really happy to meet you. And especially because you're with Team Hardpoint, which is in our industrial park right next to the racetrack. Right, absolutely. So it's I'm my home track now. <laughs> I know, that's great. How do you like it? Oh, I love it. I've always loved BIR. You know, I've been based in America now on and off since 2005. And uh, it's definitely one of the, the cool tracks that we have on our schedule within IMSA. And uh, I spend a lot of time there now that I'm racing for Team Hardpoint. So we do a lot of rollouts and uh, a lot of events. And it's, I mean, it's a beautiful area, but the track is, it's storied. It's not one of those like, fake bin designed kind of tracks it follows it's got elevation it follows the the lay of the land and it, and it's just super fun to drive well thank you as harvey my founding partner would say built before lawyers and when sex was safe and racing was dangerous <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so you can imagine which one of those two kerrigan latched on to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so what um how did you get started in motorsport tell us a little bit about your your path so a long, long time ago now, um, back in England, as you can tell, I'm not from uh, not from around here. Um, I started racing go-karts and it was literally just my dad and I would travel around England um, every weekend and we just really enjoyed it. It was the competition, the speed, the bonding that we had because I was always super close to my dad. And uh, I, I got the opportunity to kind of progress from karting and got like bits and pieces here and there and like a Formula Ford 1600 and, and different different things and didn't really think anything of it. You know, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to make a career out of racing. I wanted to, I was driven to, but, you know, at that time there wasn't really any women in racing. You had Vincent James, Janet Guthrie and Sarah Fisher. Yeah. And so they were all on this side of the pond and, and, back on my side of the pond, there wasn't really anybody. So even though I was trying, I didn't ever think it was going to be a career. First of all, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. But I couldn't <laughs> because my eyesight is too bad. Then I wanted to be an economist. <laughs> and I realized it probably wasn't for me. Um, so I kept on going down the, the racing route. And uh, actually it was Vicky O'Connor who um, used to run the Atlantic Series, owned and run the Atlantic Series. Uh, introduced me to Kevin Kalkoven, who owned Champ Car at the time. And he was in England buying Cosworth. And uh, I basically, <laughs> a little bit crazy, I basically went and sat in the lobby of Cosworth until he would see me. And uh, it wasn't him that saw me. It was his daughter and his fiance at the time, now wife. And they were the ones who persuaded him to, to give me a shot and, and, you know, take a look at me. So he gave me the first three races in 2005 in the Atlantic series, bearing in mind, I never raced a full season in cars before. And the Atlantic cars like pretty big. Wow. So um, they said, okay, you can get, have the first three races in, in Atlantics and we'll see how you get on. And I won the first race. So after that it was kind of like history. So I, uh, yeah, I've been very fortunate. I've driven everything in my career from champ car to Indy car to formula E to DTM to electric cars um, and with the Jaguar, to the Delta Wing. Obviously, you remember the Delta Wing and yeah. Dr. Panos. He was super cool. Um, so, yeah, I've probably had one of the NASCAR. I've had one of the most diverse careers in motorsport, and I've been super fortunate. That is just amazing. I had no idea. That's, you know, I guess I started following you more when, when I heard about your horrible crash at Paul Ricard and your amazing recovery from that. Can you tell us a little more about that? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so one of the cars that I've driven <laughs> was uh, the LMP2 car. And that was in, in Europe, um, gosh, just over a year ago now. And uh, racing for Richard Mille, still racing for Richard Mille, but in, in the States this time. And uh, it was preseason testing and it was the, the week of the first race. And I was on an in lap and I was going around the fastest corner on the track. And I don't know whether anybody knows Porter car, but it's really, really hard to hit anything there. <laughs> but I managed it. Um, it wasn't even a fast crash. It was in the fastest part of the track, but there's so much runoff that I lost most of the speed. I think I was probably only doing like 80 miles an hour max. Um, but the way the car folded into me, it broke both of my legs in multiple places. Um, 
that's gone on my wrist. I don't know whether you can see that. And uh, yeah, I've I've had a few crashes in my career, but none that have done me any damage. And and this did me quite a lot of damage. And I'm not 18 anymore, so I didn't bounce back as quickly as I would like to. But um, you know, a year later, and you wouldn't apart from apart from a few scars, you wouldn't notice any difference. I'm back running. Um, I was actually. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, I, I I help a lady called Eileen in Ferrari Challenge. And I was in a wheelchair when I came back, like two and a half months later. And uh, we were at Cota, I think. Yeah, it was Cota. And I got out of the wheelchair with my arms. I pushed myself out of the wheelchair in my, with my arms. And I got into the Ferrari Challenge car. And I drove her around in the Ferrari Challenge car just to see, like, okay, A, can I do it? B, am I going to be like scared of racing anymore? Um, but the thing that really scared me was what if I've lost it? What if this has made me like not fast anymore? And that was terrifying. So, uh, yeah, against all the doctor's better judgment, they were saying, don't do anything. Don't you couldn't even walk, but I was driving a driving a race car. <laughs> so did you get back up to speed? pretty quickly yeah yeah pretty quickly the first couple of laps were a little scary you know because you kind of all discombobulated and you you lose your bearings and you don't know how hard you can push the pedals you don't know you know you don't want to crash again and you don't want to be focused on not crashing because I do believe that you always kind of do what you're focused on so if you say to yourself don't crash don't crash don't crash you're gonna crash you know because your mind like latches onto that word so um it was it was a little bit the first few laps were a little bit iffy, but it did prove to me that A, I still wanted to do it. B, I still could do it. And uh, I think it was it was good mental motivation, if you like, to get me to do all of the things that I had to do, all of the rehab things, because, you know, it can be quite depressing when you're in a wheelchair and you can't get around anything at, anywhere. And my parents came over, luckily, and it was during COVID, so it was really tough for anybody to get anywhere um it was like the beginning of covid so um my mom was helping me you know she was like helping me in the shower because you can't stand up in the shower you have to like sit on this little stool and all these things and when you're used to being a strong independent woman you don't want to be dependent on your mother again at 30 or whatever years old it was so um i'm very grateful to her (laughs) but also i was very frustrated at the time i talked to mine all the time Sorry, mom. (laughs) Oh, gosh. So you just said that I wanted to do it and that I could do it. Which of those two do you think was weighing more heavily on your mind? Um, I think the thought that whether I would still be fast or not, I think, you know, whether it would have affected me so that I didn't push the car to the limit or whether I was still thinking about it. I, I think I always knew that with modern day medicine I would be able to physically do it luckily thank goodness touch wood um but mentally is a whole a whole different matter and so I was just I'm stubborn I guess and uh, I was just happy that I I still I still got it (laughs) and if you hadn't wanted to do it what would you do next that is a million dollar question. And that's one that keeps me up at night and scares the living bejesus out of me. I don't, I honestly, Connie, I don't know. Um, I think that's part of the motivation that keeps me racing because I'm, I'm so driven and I've got blinkers on in this direction that I've never thought, what else would I do? I, my dad builds houses and I'm interested in real estate. So I'm guessing it would be something down those lines, but I'm also not the kind of person who's just going to sit around and do lunch and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't know. And the prospect of that, I think it'll always be in racing some way because the prospect of that actually scares me, like literally scares me and and not many things do scare me. So there's that. Thanks for bringing that. (laughs) I'm kidding. A drink. When I was little, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Oh, cool. My dad convinced me that I probably didn't really want to do that. And then I studied economics <laughs> and got a degree in economics and served on a Federal Reserve advisory board for a few years with the Federal Reserve president who races horses here. <laughs> so that was oh, really cool. fun. And then went into real estate. So started out in retail site selection for tenants and was introduced to Harvey, my founding partner, and was able to be involved in the very beginning of EIR. So 
it finds a way. It finds a wow, way. Wow, that's spooky. That's really some. Uh... <laughs> it is. Well, I have to ask you a question that people ask me all the time, and that's how does it feel to be a woman in motorsport, especially as a race car driver? Does that question like wind you up a little bit too? Like, I understand why people ask it, but I can't wait for the time when we don't have to answer that question, right? Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> same, 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 same. I don't, I don't hate it because I understand that people are interested in our perspective, right? Because we are a minority in um, a man's world. But the thing is, we've both been doing it a while now, and. Um, we don't know what it's like to be a man in this world. We only know what it's like from our perspective. And it's, you know, we've had to, we've had to fight maybe differently to a lot of the guys, but at the end of the day, we're both professionals and we've both been taken seriously for the most part. So whilst it's, it's definitely different, I think it's, it's hard to give a comparison because we don't know the other, the flip side of the coin. Yeah. When people ask me, I say, well, it probably feels the same as being a man who owns a racetrack, except for he has an Audi and I have an Inn. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> and that stops them. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. But, you know, Lynn St. James, who you mentioned earlier, has talked with me a lot about this and the need to, you know, kind of stand up to be a, a role model and to, you know, help aspire younger girls who may not see this direction as possible for them. but that's hard to do when you never had a roadblock that you couldn't manage, just like anybody trying to progress. So we'll find our way in that and hopefully just won't be identified as female. So. Yeah, we'll just be known for what we have achieved and, and not our gender. But I also do think that it takes a certain type of personality to do what we've done, right? Like we've, we've got that never give up kind of attitude. Um, and so roadblocks to us that maybe would stop other people haven't stopped us and we have because we haven't seen them as roadblocks we've just seen them as obstacles to get through instead so I think it's more a personality issue than a than a gender issue yeah just like entrepreneurship I mean you either have it or you don't you know and the drive to drive fast and push yourself and drive so many different series and cars as you have that's unusual for anybody yeah (laughs) pretty cool which did you like best or is that an unfair Mm. question (laughs) No, uh, the champ car, you know, the old champ car with the with both turbos and it was like big and burly and it kicked you in the butt and it was just, you had to fight it. It was like doing battle with it. It was just the, the coolest car I've ever driven. I drove the Formula One car and that's obviously very fast and refined and very smooth, but but the old champ car on, on the old American circuits, there was nothing quite like that. And, and <laughs> I, I wish we could go back to those days. Me too, because that was before my time, and I've heard a lot about it. Sounds like a really Mm -hmm. fun time. It was really cool. So what do you like to do when you're not racing? Oh, when I'm not racing, um, I'm mostly working on racing. (laughs) So I'm training. I I like spending time on the water, Um, like wakeboarding and and literally just floating around. I have have a dog that I'll go run with or I'll go hiking with. Um, And then the usual the usual stuff hanging out with my friends you know watching movies cooking um shopping <laughs> the usual yeah i like to use paddleboard and sail so we have another thing in common oh yeah i did paddleboarding the other day actually i was with a friend in uh, jacksonville and uh, we were on the inlet there so there were no waves or anything and it was perfect and it was sunny and it was gorgeous so there's nowhere around here that you can do it without falling off multiple times <laughs> Well, when you come to BIR, I'll get you over to Heiko Lake. It's 12 miles away. And oh, yeah. I'm on board almost every morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's what keeps you fit, huh? Two hours. <laughs> so <laughs> so let me ask you, um, tacos and tequila or surf and turf? Tacos and tequila, 100%. Yeah. No question. <laughs> Actually, there's a, there's a place in Danville called Mucho's. And they do pretty good margaritas, I have to say. They do. I have a New York one that's outstanding. <laughs> so I love it. So tell us a little bit more about how you got involved with um, Team Hard Sport and, and what it means to be, you know, at a racetrack. Does that really matter to the team and to you, or is it just the occasional competing? So um, I was out, uh, as you mentioned before, I was out most of last year with my legs broken. 
And so I didn't really know anything about Team Hardpoint. I didn't know anything about Rob Burial, um, apart from that he was Spencer Pompelli's teammate. And um, I didn't know how good he was. I didn't know who ran the team, who owned the team, like literally, literally nothing until I was talking to John Doonan, who obviously is the uh, the chief at, at IMSA. And um, he was the one who put us in touch with Hardpoint and, and Rob and, and Will Bamber at the time. And um, he basically put us there as, as part of an all-female team because we wanted to showcase female talent within IMSA. And, um, you know, Rob was actually really, really cool. He, he totally bought on. He's got uh, two daughters and um, he said, you know, he's been to war with women. So he was super supportive of what we were trying to achieve. And um, that's half the battle. Half the battle is trying to get yourself in a good car that is competitive and that can win because there are only a handful of good cars and there's a lot of not so competitive cars out there. So um, knowing that they're a brand new team, um, you know, it's the first year with Porsche. Um, they're based, obviously, at VIR. They've got that brand new workshop that's coming along really nicely. I saw it last week. And, um, you know, we, we just, it, it just kind of works. It's, it's really good. Rob's vision for Hardpoint uh, completely aligns with what we're trying to achieve. And I can see a very long and, and fruitful future um, with Hardpoint. You know, I think it's difficult being a new team because you take people from here, there and everywhere and you try and, and make them gel together. And that takes time, right? And you need to weed out the good ones and the bad ones and, and you need to bring people on board where you're missing things. And it's, it's a process. It's not like the Penske's and Ganassi's of the world decided that they were going to start a team and they won the first race they went and did. You know, it took them a year to, to put the team together. But everybody on the team... I love it because we all pull in the same direction. We're all one team. Nobody points fingers or blames anybody. You know, we struggled a little bit this year, but we're all working together forward to make it really good for the future. And so while you don't have many years in racing and you don't really want to sacrifice any years in racing, I really feel like we've come such a long way this year that there's another level of satisfaction, satisfaction and achievement by building something or helping to build something um, with that. So I'm a very proud member of, of Team Hardpoint and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the future. That's great. We're pulling for you, you know, and everything you've said is my first impression of Rob and he's been a club member here for a while and he's just so driven, but so supportive at the same time. And it's, you know, really refreshing and we feel very honored to have our pro team. I'm getting goosebumps <laughs> in our industrial park. So welcome. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. So you mentioned Spencer Pompelli, who was one of the first racers I got to know because we think he was conceived on Spectator Hill. <laughs> that probably wouldn't surprise me. Hanging out with Spencer and, and Andy Lally and some of the guys. And I just wonder who's fastest, you, Andy, or Spencer? Oh, crikey. If they watch this and I say me, I'm never going to hear the end of it. So <laughs> we, uh, we all live in Atlanta, actually, and we're all super good friends. And um, so we all hang out on a regular basis. And I would say we're all, this is going to sound really PC, but it's actually genuine. Like I, I do genuinely believe this. I think we all have our day, right, where one or other of us would be faster. Um, uh, they're both obviously very, very, very talented race car drivers um, that have achieved a lot. Um, I don't know. I would like to think I would be faster, but um, you know what we should do one day? And I've said this to Rob. I think that we should all get Miatas or something and go race VIR, all of us, like Team Atlanta, Rob, Team Hardpoint, and uh, and like see who genuinely would be be the fastest in the same exact car when you're when you're put in, in that situation. That would be fun. That would be awesome. <laughs> We might have to settle for go-karts at VIR instead. <laughs> We're getting ready to participate in a go-kart event here right before the IMSA event. I believe it's on October 8th, right? Yep. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. Looking forward to it. It's for a great cause. And, um, you know, when Kerrigan phones you and, and asks you to do something, it's really difficult to say no. That's true. He does that to me all the time. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that event, the CKG event, what it means. So... Doing. 
um, there's going to be one pro driver with every with every team, and uh, so basically we're going to have to train up our teams and um, lead the teams to victory. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, racewear giveaways and and charity kind of auctions and things alongside it. It's going to get a lot of attention because it's right before the VIR and the race weekend. So um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on and it's it's just it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun for everybody involved as well. I'm not sure whether it's open to the public or not. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, what what's going on with that? But I'm sure we'll get more details closer to the time. Yeah, and we'll work on that. So I know that's the Cameron Gallagher Foundation, and I believe it is to support teen mental health. And Sorry, yeah, absolutely. It's, so it's you know with COVID and everybody you know, the extra stress on these poor kids and having to homeschool and not have their regular socialization, you know, that that's true. Yeah. Certainly ties into this and we're just real excited to be a, you know, the host facility. So, you know, we're making them most welcome and hope that's a very successful fundraiser. The, what we're hearing has been very strong and thank you very much for participating in that. Oh no, thanks for having me. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to share or promote with us before we say goodbye? Oh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a bunch of things, but um, no, I would like to say thank you very much for flying the flag for us girls, Connie. Appreciate that. Um, I think everybody should come to the VIR race, right? Because it's so much fun. And um, come and say hi. And we'll give you some stickers. <laughs> We've got these cool new stickers made and an autograph. And we'll do some pictures and uh, we'll, we'll have a really good time. That sounds great. We'll come see you in the paddock and cheer for Team Hardpoint. And thanks very much for joining me. I've really enjoyed our discussion today. And uh, Same. Fun. thank you. Same. Thanks very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.